Thank you. Uh, so I know I'm the last before happy hour. So let us just, who's ready for happy hour? Happy hour? Woo. Too bad, last talk. Uh, I want to take you on a journey, uh, a journey with many cats and the journey of learning. I'd like for you to imagine that you're a younger version of yourself. Maybe you, like me, come from an era that recommended setting up a lamp stack or a blog with that lamp stack to become familiar with a technology. You set up your lamp stack, you copy code from a GeoCity page or Angel Fire if you're newer, I guess. And you have your blog, bam. Uh, what are people doing now to try technology? I think that today's LAMP stack is Kubernetes, containers, and Go. We skip over databases because it is impossible, but we're still copying code, but it's from GitHub and Stack Overflow now. And you don't even need to use your own computer because Amazon has instances for you, even fancy new ARM instances. So let's say you're a newcomer and you wanna try all this stuff out. You decide to use the ARM instances because they sound kind of cool, right, ARM? -er. Well, you follow docs and all the tutorials, and you have a Kubernetes. Yes! And it's on ARM, whatever that means, but double yay. And now you want to install stuff. But how? Well, it turns out there's a blog post for that, too. But you run into some problems. Stuff won't install, and all you see is some weird exact format error. Well, it's because the images that docs told you to use aren't going to work on your ARM or hardware. Welcome to my talk. Multi-architecture container images, why bother, and how to. Let's get going. But a quick stop along the way, as was happily pointed out, my name is Lisa Seeley. If you're wondering what to do with all those vowels, don't worry. I'm the doe on the bird site. I work at Red Hat as a senior SRE on the OpenShift dedicated team, which is hosted Kubernetes. So if Kubernetes scares you, pay us. We'll do it, please. Uh, if that sort of thing excites you, we are hiring. So find me if that's your jam. Uh, personally, I have about 20 years of Linux experience. I was a Gen 2 dev for a few years in the mid to early mid 2000s. I have a sysadmin background, but also a Ruby. Yay, Ruby. Um, I like different architectures, had Spark when I was younger, but I like ARM these days, and uh, I'm a cat enthusiast. Now, to keep things relatively straightforward, this talk is going to be using Docker and its tools. I know there's a lot of ways to do it, but I think most people come to containers via Docker, and heck, Docker has been synonymous with containers so much, that's what people think containers are. And this is going to be a fairly low level talk. No one's gonna to need to know what CPU architectures are, how they work, what the Linux kernel is doing, or even any Go. We're gonna be talking nuts and bolts. Now a question. When somebody says container, what comes to mind? Chances are you're thinking about this, or I've seen this kind of image used to represent the idea of containers, you know, the container ship filled with shipping containers. Those containers represent your app, and the ship represents your servers and how they can move around the cloud or something like that. Are there lighthouses in the cloud? Does anybody know? I don't even know. But what if it's all a lie? <laughs> okay, maybe it's not a lie per se. It is an abstraction, but it breaks down when you look at the inner workings as uh, Alice stole my thunder this morning pointing out it's all lies. But what I mean is, there's more to containers in the marketing lingo of, it's your app. It runs anywhere. <laughs> containers come from images, and images are things we build with Docker files. And again, I know, I know, you're probably thinking, but, but my favorite tool, we're talking about Docker. I know there's more ways to pet this cat, but just Docker for now, please. But what's in an image then? Well, this is your image. <laughs> If you save any old container image from the internet to disk, you can untar it and look inside. Yeah, that's right. It's a tarball with more tarballs inside and JSON files along. At least it's not XML. <laughs> that's a lot of work to get tarballs to your servers or someone else's servers, as the case may be. <laughs> Serverless, huh? Now, at this point, you might be realizing we've been deploying our apps as tarballs for years decades, and you might feel a little cheated. 
well, it is a little silly to concoct the whole new system just to deploy tarball, so there's got to be more here, right? Yes, because this is slide 12 of 150. No, just kidding. Uh, the building block of this container movement is the image. And that means that each of the files that we just saw inside the image must do something specific or why include them. Well, let's see what they do. The JSON config file tells, the local Docker, tells your local Docker daemon information about the image. This includes information, how it was built, the author, how to run the image, that's like what command do we even run, and what environment variables do I set, and so on and so on. Uh, it also contains what architecture the image was meant to run on. The layer tarballs are the actual substance of your image. Maybe it's a compiled Go program, maybe it's a Ruby script, yeah Ruby, maybe it's a bunch of libraries, configuration files, or a full Linux file system. The number of layers you have depends on what you're doing in your Docker file. Finally, the JSON manifest file ties all these bits together. It points to that config file, points to all the layers in the image, and uh, the manifest is gonna be important to us later on. <laughs> but how do we actually get an image? Well, we have to go deeper. I've shown the contents of an image, but I've hand waved over how we get one. So how does a human language concept of dear image registry, I want that image, translate to bytes on disk? Well, it turns out that it depends on the kind of manifest the image uses, as of course there's more than one, but there's just two we're gonna focus on now. Images with manifest lists and ones without a manifest list. First though, let's look at images without a manifest list. That's when you pull the image or download it. That's what pulling means. It's basically the same thing as curling some tarball down to your computer. If you curl the wrong one, oops, oh well. I'll show you what this looks like in a little bit. Next is a little less common, images that are using a manifest list. We are going to talk a whole lot more about this topic in a few more sections, but for now, Think of it as like curl with some logic in there to give you the right image, sort of, sometimes. Now, I'd like to show you what is likely to be similar to every Docker tutorial on the internet. Maybe that tutorial will tell you to paste two commands to pull an image and then run it. So let's do it. I hope that uh, Kino cooperates because it has in the past. Boom. All right, so we're going to do this. If you want to follow along at home, you can. We're going to pull this image. Oh. Can you make it a little bit I will do that. How's that? Better? Okay. All right, so we're going to pull this one. Go. Hey, we downloaded it. Hey, now let's run it. Yes, Docker tutorial, we did it, we did it. We verified everything. And we see that build time, this image was built to run on Linux slash AMD 64. And the platform it's being run on is Linux AMD 64. We did it, Docker 101. But let's, let's say you're our new person from the beginning and you wanted to do this on your fancy ARM instance. What happens then? Well, you'd probably copy and paste those same two commands and uh, We'll do that too. Here is a uh, ARM64 instance I prepared earlier. This is actually running in my basement. And we'll do the same thing. We'll, we'll pull it, we'll download it. And we'll run it just like before. And, ah, uh, exact user process cause exact format error. Huh, well, luckily, I can find my mouse. I have a slide for that. Boom. Well, I think you'll agree that that error message isn't very fun. And if you're a beginner, it might actually pitch you off. Or if you're stubborn, you might actually whinge a bit on Twitter, dig into why it's not working, write a blog post, and then a conference talk to try and convince people of another way. 
Huh, okay. Well, as it happens, I happened to run an ARM64 cluster at home, just like my newbie friend. Spoiler, it was me all along. Why do I run ARM? Well, they're small, like credit card size small. They're low power, low costs. And to be honest, I kind of like throw off the beaten path. I'm a little bit of a hipster that way. Uh, I use the cluster to experiment with Kubernetes topics so I don't have to pay a cloud provider every month because I do that to almost every cloud provider already. So my money, please. I'd like to share what it's like to install software into my cluster. Uh, these are real life experiences from this year. My first encounter with software in my cluster was the Kubernetes dashboard back in March or April this year. At uh, the time, I saw that same exact format error when, when I followed the installation documentation on the Kubernetes website. I didn't realize there were specific files for ARM64 users tucked away in the GitHub repository. The docs on the main webpage didn't make it clear. I wasn't new to Kubernetes, but I was new to it on ARM. So to find that the dashboard didn't work as documented was kind of frustrating. That said, I'm happy to say that the docs and images all align for a good user experience these days. So I had a tip to the dashboard maintainer for that. Next are two kind of lump into one, Helm and Valero. Uh, these are unique in that they actually ship with an installation binary that is responsible for creating all the stuff inside your Kubernetes cluster. Helm is like a package manager for Kubernetes if you're not in the know. I'll share a little bit more about what Flero is in just a minute, including how it went to install it. And finally, Keneco and Tecton Pipelines are two other pieces of the software that I was using in my cluster. What's Keneco? Keneco is used to more safely build uh, container images inside Kubernetes, and Tecton Pipeline provides for a Kubernetes native CI CD style pipeline. We'll revisit those later. But first, let's install Flero. Uh, so along my journey, as we install, I will narrate some. I heard about Valero from a coworker who was evaluating it, and I, I thought it would help me back up and restore my cluster data. You see, I wanted to pave over my cluster and restore the data, because what are lab clusters for, right? I was super excited to try it out, because backups are a pain in the butt. And if I could use a native Kubernetes solution, I could be pretty sure to back up everything I needed to get my workload going quickly when I was ready to reinstall. You can't imagine my surprise when I saw it was an ARM64 installer. So I grabbed version one of the, of the software and got to work. After my experience with the Kubernetes dashboard earlier in the year, I sit on the Valero experiment with some trepidation, wondering if I would see the dreaded exec format error. They call this foreshadowing. Excuse me. But it installed. And I cut a lot of the output here and pixelated it on purpose, so it's harder to read in the back. Apologies. Uh, but it says right there, Valero is installed. Let's see what it's up to. Now, when I saw this, I was wondering, huh, is it provisioning my GCP bucket for my backups? Did it already start the initial backup? Or do I have to do something on my own to kick that off? Maybe make some fancy custom resource? Uh, well, no, uh, it turns out I got the dreaded exact format error message. Valero didn't actually install. So what happened is that the Valero application image is built for AMD64, not ARM64, which means that the ARM64 installation binary was kind of a tease. Helm had the same experience, so I don't need a set of images to show you that, because I've given up the joke. Now, it's a find that Valero and Helm aren't meant to run on ARM64. Now, I'm not saying that people need to cross compile and support every weird architecture out there. What I am saying is it's a poor experience for me as an ARM64 user. But why does it matter? Well, I came to these projects with the belief that they'd run in my environment. Why? Well, Kubernetes runs on ARM, and I expect the dashboard to run too. The docs didn't suggest it wouldn't. Valero and Helmer both have ARM installers, so I figured they'd install for ARM. These user experiences all have one thing in common. It is frustrating when there's this buzz. Anyone get the joke? joke? No? Yeah. <laughs> when you're giving a talk, always have hype people and laugh at your bad jokes. So yeah, so uh, to be honest, it's, it's frustrating when there's this buzz around tools that you can't use. 
I know that Kubernetes runs on ARM since I'm running Kubernetes on ARM. But the docs back in the earlier part of the year weren't written with us in mind. Valero and Helm both had installers for ARM, but they installed ARM AMD64 images. All these projects and the various libraries are shouting, I support ARM, but the user experience says otherwise. There's a, there's a way to bring harmony to the message and the user experience so the expectations set by the culture are realized. If you remember from the very first demos I showed you, those images lacked a manifest list. What we saw is what we got, and what we got was AMD64. Let me introduce the manifest list, which offers a list of manifests to pick from. A recap first. Here are two very simplified manifests for two images. These don't use a list. Some things to highlight, the name of the image on the very first line, it's different, AMD versus ARM. The ID hash on the second line, also called a digest. The last couple lines are the layers that make up the image. And remember, these are gonna be our application code and related files. On the other hand, here's an overly simplified example of a manifest list. Ultimately, for each architecture in the list, we have the corresponding digest hash for the listed platform's image. Keen eyes will note that the digests are the same as the IDs from the previous slide, which means since the digests are the same, we can kind of just substitute in the image manifests. Here's my ID, here's the file system layer that correspond to the important data. Again, this is wildly simplified. In real life, the manifests don't actually copy and paste stuff in, but it, it does help to visualize what's actually going on logically. But do take note of the image on the very first line. No architecture references like in the non-list examples. This is intentional. We can give people this name as the thing they use to install, and they'll get the right image for their platform if it's listed, usually. So I, I believe manifest lists are the future, and, and they are the, the, the most recent spec, so they are the future. Many popular images are already using them. You're probably using them already if you're using Docker. Remember, it's a Docker talk. BusyBox, Ubuntu, CentOS, and more. By virtue of supporting multiple architectures in a single name, it means that the docs can point to one name and have it work for any supported architecture. And if the architecture isn't supported, it'll fail at pull time, not run time, most of the time. <laughs> also foreshadow. Okay, so there's these lists and these manifests and lots of JSON blobs, and it all sounds super appealing, right? Well, let's create one. First, let me set the scene. We're packaging our app up, and we want it to run on AMD64 and ARM64. Like most, on the path to automating our pipeline, we'll do the first one by hand. Yes, uh, but I'm gonna cheat a little bit, because there's a lot of typing. And uh, so I wrote a small shell script to do it all for me, so we can focus on the story, not me making a million typos. Believe me, there would be a million typos. Wait till you see how long this thing is. It's, it's wild. All right. Bigger? Font bigger? Thumbs up for bigger? Yeah. All right. I'm, would you believe I made a presentation and it just didn't load it? Okay, so here we go. Everybody ready? Whew. First step. Imagine me typing furiously as we go through this. So first step, initial setup. What we're gonna do is note that this is an experimental feature of Docker, which means that the client needs to be in experimental mode, and the daemon does too. The daemon is gonna be distribution specific since I use Gentoo, remember Gentoo dev? We put it in a weird place, so I'll leave it up to you as an exercise to figure out how to enable it. Next, we'll print out what we're gonna be building and do some cleanup. We're gonna build this image. For people following along at home, this is gonna be built in real time and the version is going to be this, 19.10.1, and we're just gonna clean up. I wrote a make file to automate this, so we're just gonna use the make file to do the cleaning up. So, it's cleaned up. But first real step of the build process, we need to build the individual images for each architecture, and we'll do that now. Some things to note is that the dash dash platform is also experimental, I'll scroll up in a second. 
is dash dash experimental is ex dash dash platform is experimental. So we need that flag enabled. And we're passing, trying to tell Docker, we're going to build an AMD64 image. We're also passing in a, an argument into the build context. The name of it is GoArch, and the value is AMD64. And as we go through, we do the building, and hey, look, we have an image. Ta-da, we did it. Now let's build the ARM image. Similar, dash dash platform, dash dash go arch, except it's gonna be ARM64. You might be looking at this saying, wait, hey, step one, our go arch equals AMD64, what? That's the default in the Docker file. Ignore it, it's overridden, trust me. And while I'm meandering along, hey look, it just built, we did it. Um, the next step is, if you remember I mentioned that the, the manifest or the uh, configuration lists the architecture that the image is meant to run on? Well, it turns out that that's not strictly what's happening behind the scenes. Docker doesn't seem to actually set that value. Um, nothing bad happens if you don't do this, but I'm kind of a completionist, so we're gonna do that. So we're gonna fix that metadata. Incidentally, if you build this on ARM, you have to set it for AMD64, so weird. Uh, let's see, so we're going to save the image, the ARM64 image that we just built as a tarball. Remember, it's just tarballs. And we're going to untar it and look at the juicy metadata inside. These files should look familiar, similar to what we just seen. Uh, it's saved a little differently from before. Don't worry about it. It's a little different. It's fine. Um, and we need to find the config file. Uh, since we're a human being, we can look at it and go, well, it's not manifest.json. That's clearly the manifest file. It's not these two directories because they're going to be layers. So it's probably this thing that ends in .json. But since we're going to be automating this in the future, let's use a computer to figure that out. And we can do that by looking in the manifest file. Remember, the manifest can include the pointer to it. Boop, point. Now we have it. And we'll use handy dandy JQ to look into the existing config file for our ARM64. Remember, this is ARM. This should be saying ARM, not AMD. We'll, we'll change it using JQ. Hey. And we'll just check and make sure it actually did the thing. And it did. Whew, thank God. Long demo to get wrong, huh? Now, since we're doing a, a swap and replace, we've got to delete the one that exists already. It's bad. Delete, boom, gone. Hey, Docker, where am I? We did it. And uh, remember when I said it's just a tarball and there's more than one way to make a tarball? This is one way to make a tarball or make a, a Docker image. You tar it up. Oh, I'm typing into Docker. Yay. We did it. So the correct one is now in our local Docker. Exactly what we want. AMD64 hanging out by ARM64. We're good. Now we need to push the two of them up to Docker Hub. Remember, Docker example, Docker Hub. You can use a GCR, any other registry, mostly will work. And up they go. Now let's do ARM. Now the magic, or the next thing, is to build a manifest list. This is significantly shorter than all the previous steps. We use the docker manifest create command. Docker manifest is an experimental feature, of course. We pass it the name of the image that we want to be creating, and this is the name of the image we want to be creating. Remember, the do slash lisa19 colon 19.10.1. And extra parameters or arguments are going to be the constituents that go into that image. We have ARM, we have AMD64. I mean, they created, ta-da. But now we need to go and add the references into the list. You can kind of think of it as we've allocated it, now let's just stuff in the points. Then we add the AMD64 with Docker manifest annotate. We reference the image list this way, and we just pass in the one. And we use these special flags, OS and Arch, to say what platform they should run on. Pretty straightforward, maybe. 
this isn't very clearly documented. It's not straightforward. Thanks, Docker. And we do the same thing for ARM. We push it up to Docker Hub and, again, Docker Manifest, experimental, yay. Uh, and anyone following along at home can actually pull this down and do what we're going to do is test it. The first thing, just like at the start, we'll clean our slate. Just wash your hands and get a fresh area to work in. First things first, let's ask Docker Hub if it has an AMD64 image for us to run. Uh -huh. So we'll ask for it specifically with docker pull dash dash platform to say, I want this one specifically, okay? And we get it and we run it. And just like the first demo, hey, look, it's meant to run on AMD64 and it, this is actually being run on AMD64. Okay, let's try ARM, clean slate, pull down ARM, specifically only ARM, and ooh, it's like format error. This is what we expect to see because we're trying to run an image that isn't meant to run on our architecture, on our architecture. That's great, okay? But we have, as a first step of all automation is done by hand or by script. If you're cheating and doing it live, and don't want to type 30 commands. It's really like 30 commands to do this, by the way. So let's see what it looks like with make. Oh dear, where'd my cursor go? So we're gonna build a different version. We're gonna build 19.10.2. We'll clean it up just in case there's anything lingering and we'll run make. Yay. <sighs> Typing furiously, furiously. And it's doing the exact same steps as before. It's cleaning up. It's building the AMD64 image first. It's taking forever because we can't see it, all the lines going. Fine. Build arm. Fix the image manifest. Push it up. Create the manifest list. Add the individual architectures, and bang, we're done. But let's, let's test it. Is this legible to everyone in the back this far down? I hope. Bad time to be asking now, but we're good. Thumbs up. Thank you. So we're going to validate default. Now this is going to use the thing we just built to download whatever Docker Hub wants to give us. We're not going to specify anything. The library we're using is just going to say, hey, give me this whatever. It's cool, whatever you should give me. And uh, what it gave us was in the AMD64 image, just what we expect. What this is doing behind the scenes, this is downloading it as a tarball. It's extracting it, it's looking into the manifest, and looking into the juicy, gooey binary that lives inside. Let's specifically ask for an AMD64 version. We should see the same exact output because this is an AMD64 machine, and we see that. It gave us AMD64. How about ARM64? We pull down the ARM64 image, save it as a tarball, extract it. This is coming from the manifest that we just fixed and pushed up. We look at the GUI GUI binary center, and it's AR64 or ARM64. Our automation pipeline works. Sweet. And now, <laughs> when I was first learning out, learning how to do this by hand, uh, it was pretty rough. There's legit like 20, 25, 30 steps. Happy to have make. If you want to do this with make, guess what? Links to the source code will be at the end. But why bother? Why do any of this? Well, with manifest list, docs can be unified with a single named reference. Instead of different docs for different architecture, less to write, less to maintain. Show of hands, who likes to write documentation? No, but, oh, that was my hype crowd. <laughs> for the most of us in the room who did not raise our hand, 
this lets us write less docs, maintain fewer docs, good stuff. Amazon already has ARM64 instances, so the diversity is coming. What vendor is going to make the move next? Why not be ready for it now? And, and maybe if we can shift our thinking from one, one, one image per architecture, we can also reflect that in our software engineering, which brings me to, I have a confession. This talk is about software development philosophy too. I deferred some stuff a while ago, and now it's time to pay down that debt. We all know that software engineering needs opinionated decisions. Otherwise, it'd be endless feature creep, and Docker would be reading my email and opposing my mail lists. But I think some of those decisions can be more open and more cross-platform from the start. Within the container ecosystem, there's plenty of software used in other software, libraries and other tooling, that have made decisions that aren't necessarily cross-platform even though the ecosystem is cross-platform. This is an excerpt from the Go Container Registry Library, which is used in quite a lot of, quite a lot of places to fetch images from registries. And uh, the validate thing that we just ran from the make uses this library. This snippet is responsible for fetching remote images based on the requested platform. How this method is called involves tracing through a bunch of this library, but at the end, this method takes a single parameter, named platform, which is a data structure that, is, that describes a combination like Linux and AMD64, Linux and ARM64, Darwin and AMD64. And if you don't explicitly say what platform you want, the default is AMD64 slash Linux, which if you're not running AMD64 slash Linux, could be a problem. But we can read the comments. This is a naive approach and there's a blocker preventing the implementation of some other method. I get it. If I'm so bothered, I can open a pull request, right? Well, I'd, I'd like to, believe me, but I'm still a Go beginner, and I feel like this is out of my reach. But my issue isn't even with the default. I get it. A choice had to be made when the library was created. What is, what is a worry is how widespread this library is and the lag time for those uh, libraries to apply new updates. Would everyone apply the update overnight? There's a lot of ripples from libraries using libraries. One of those ripples is Kaneko, which I've mentioned a couple times. Just to reiterate, Kaneko is open source software used to build container images inside Kubernetes without needing the Docker socket. Not even the Docker socket is nice because if you let people access the socket, it's basically the same as giving them root access to your machine. Not what you want, usually, unless you're, you're a hacker. Um, traditionally, we build images with Docker build, and that needs the socket. So if you're building a CI CD pipeline inside of Kubernetes, there's a gap to fill, and Canical fills that gap. But since it's based on Go Container Registry, it has some of the drawbacks I just mentioned. What's more, the Canical build process targets only AMD64, although this is in process of changing. Another ripple, and speaking of CI-CD pipelines inside of Kubernetes, is uh, gonna serve as a good illustration as to some of the problems one can run in with software and libraries having weird ripple effects. I found Tekton Pipelines from a Google blog post earlier this year and thought it would be fun to try out with some CI-CD stuff that I was working on in my own time. Their docs, like the Kubernetes dashboard docs, also had a command to install a bunch of Kubernetes resources, Kube's ETL apply. And like the dashboard, it only targeted AMD64. But I thought, I'm a clever girl, I can port it. The source is right there. And so I tried but I ran into a bunch of issues. Pipeline, Tech on Pipelines uses a project called Co, KO, in its build process. What's Co? Well, Co builds Golang apps into container images for Kubernetes. Co also happens to use the same Go container registry from a few slides back, which explains why when I was building Tech on Pipelines on ARM64, the resulting images failed with exact format error. Even when the source image is used the fancy new manifest list. They had ARM64 listed. The pipeline build failed because 
uh, the Go Container Registry thing that I just mentioned. Nothing was telling the library what platform was being used to build the pipeline. So it pulled the AMD64, the default images. Tecton Pipelines doesn't even use the image pulling portion of Go Container Registry. But all the same, the decisions from that library had these ripple on effects. Now for release engineering, we can focus on creating images that support multiple architectures with manifest lists. For software engineering, I want to invite everyone to make these engineering decisions mindfully and, where possible, design for maximum portability. There's no doubt that the contributors to those libraries all had good intentions, though they have led to a series of weird cross-platform compatibility difficulties, especially when it's used in higher-level software that ostensibly sort these next-gen images. Thus, it's a two-prong approach. approach. Cross-platform software coupled with the release engineering part. And finally, I want to leave you all with some concrete takeaways. When we're designing systems and software, we put in certain decisions. That's its culture. When we write our docs for our users and our customers, that's its culture too. What's the culture of your project? Is it focused on a single platform? Is it focused on many platforms? If the goal is to be diverse and cross-platform, then maybe we can use some of these techniques to release artifacts that are inherently cross-platform. Maybe write the libraries that don't assume a single platform. But if you're focused on a single platform, that's great to have that focus, I understand. I hope it happens to be ARM that you're focused on, but if not, that's totally cool. And so that's it. Thank you. Thanks for sitting through. Um, the code and make files are up on GitHub, github.com slash lisa slash lisa19-containers. The slides and image credits are linked to lisa.dev slash conferences, if you would like to find out where all these cat pictures come from and a dog picture here and there. Um, if there are any questions, I think we have a couple minutes. All right, and just a reminder, if you want to ask a question, please come up to the microphone and also make your question brief. And if no one wants to ask questions because there's happy hour like right now, I see some people ducking out, no problem. You can find me afterwards here all week-ish. Oh, thank you so much, Lisa. Mm -hmm.